Hi, everyone. Welcome back. I hope you had enough time to catch up on email, eat lunch, and take some time for your own well-being. As we all know, self-care is extremely important right now. And for those of you that are new joining us, I'm Lisa Lee, the director of Montana No Kid Hungry and co-chair of the Montana Partnership to End Childhood Hunger. Now we'd like to ask you to please turn on your cameras again, if possible, and return to the speaker view option at the top right of your screen. And we'll be doing this for the rest of the summit. We are now entering the second half of our summit that focuses on legislative planning and policy priorities for the Montana Partnership to End Childhood Hunger. In just a minute, I will hand it over to Rachel Sartori, the Community Engagement Coordinator for Montana No Kid Hungry to MC the afternoon. To give her a brief introduction, Rachel launched the No Kid Hungry Amplify Montana initiative almost three years ago now which is a community-driven initiative to build the leadership and the advocacy skills of people who have experienced poverty and food insecurity firsthand. Along with her No Kid Hungry work, Rachel is a member of Mount Peck and currently leads the Mount Peck Policy and Advocacy Workgroup. Rachel, I'll hand over the MC hat to you now. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. It's good to see everyone's faces back again and some familiar names. Um, I'm really impressed with the turnout that we have today. So thank you all for being here. Um, so like Lisa said, we're launching into the second half of our summit with our session on the state budget. It is entitled, We Are All Connected, the Montana State Budget Overview. Heather Lachlan will be leading the session and she is the co-director of research and development at the Montana Budget and Policy Center, which is here in Helena. And Heather also has, a, has vast legislative experience by working previously as legislative director and counsel for U.S. Senator Max Baucus, as well as clerking for the Senate Finance Committee specializing in tax policy. So today she's going to provide us with some basics on understanding the state budget, as well as teaching us about the budgeting process coming up for this upcoming 2021 legislative session and providing some clues on what we might expect regarding revenue in 2021 and beyond. So this session is really important because without money in the budget, none of our other policy priorities that we care about can possibly materialize. So um, thank you, Heather, for being here and please take it away whenever you're ready. Great, well, thank you so much. Um, and it's really nice to be here with all of you. Um, I, I just wanna start by saying how, uh, how much I, uh, appreciate everything that you all are dealing with um, given COVID and uh, uh, what I imagine is, you know, pretty significant strains on, on your services. And so I just want to say thank you for everything you all are doing on the ground. Um, the work that we do uh, on the policy level and, and digging into the data really wouldn't be possible with every from, you know, with everything that you all are doing and, and hearing about how these policies are impacting folks on the ground. Um, I will also say, you know, I recognize that this can be a bit of a dense topic. And so I'm gonna hopefully take it slow and would welcome questions as, as I go through it. So I'm gonna share my screen. Hopefully this works okay. Uh, great, so um, just a little, just a quick background, Montana Budget and Policy Center, we are a nonpartisan nonprofit organization. Um, we focus primarily on research, um, uh, but we do some advocacy work. Um, and our focus is really on tax and budget policies and how those policies impact low and moderate income families in the state. Um, Montana Budget and Policy Center is also the, uh, just recently um, took over the kids count work in Montana. So we are now the Montana Kids Count organization. Um, and hopefully many of you have been able to access, we just launched a new website um, and there is some really great county level fact sheets that we just released. So I would encourage you to go take a look at that as well. So I want to just start um, by, this is just a, a quick overview of um, revenue coming into the state for the general fund and, ex and general fund expenditures um, on a year to year basis. And you can see that 
you know, these, um, these lines largely track each other. Um, there may be a little bit of variation year over year, but you can see that as, as we experience, you know, increases in revenue, um, we, we often experience increases in expenditures and vice versa. Um, I think this is important to note, um, you know, Montana ha does have a, a constitutional requirement that the legislature balance um, the budget every two years. And so it's not overly surprising that these two things track, but I think, you know, there's a lot of conversations about, you know, growth and expenditures and what that means. And really what you see year over year is that, you know, expenditures are, are tracking levels of revenue that the state has. You can see there, there is um, a pretty big exception to that over in um, 2016, 2017. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about what what happened in those years and some of you are very familiar with what happened in those years um, but we did see a dip in in uh in revenue below what was projected by the legislature in the 2015 legislative session and so um you know this there was a pretty significant gap between the revenue coming in and and projected expenditures and then you saw you know the pretty significant cuts made um, in 2017 for the, the 2018 year. So I'll talk a little bit about what makes up our budget. Um, so this is just looking at general fund dollars. Um, so really just state, state expenditures. And you can see that about half of the state um, general fund budget is, is through education. Most of that is K-12 education. Um, so money flowing through to local um, public school districts. Uh, Health and Human Services makes up about a quarter of the, of the general fund budget. And then the other big piece is really down in the judicial branch, um, primarily the Department of Corrections. So if you were to if you were to total up health and human services, education and corrections, that is the vast majority of the budget really is, the general fund budget is really within those three um, departments and, and areas. So next I'll, um, this, this provides an, uh, just how the budget looks when, when you talk about not just general fund, but total funds. So you can see the previous slide, um, the total, um, over the two year period is about $4 billion. We now are looking at a two year total of about $10 billion. So significant federal funds coming into the state. And you can see when you factor in those federal dollars, Health and Human Services makes up a much bigger piece of the pie. Um, you know, uh, generally speaking, um, you know, much of that is Medicaid funding. Um, it, it does include SNAP funding as well. Um, but, you know, when, when the state puts in $1 for Medicaid, we're typically getting about $2 in federal funds, though that varies Medicaid expansion. Um, the federal, the federal match is nine to one. Um, so it does vary, but you can just see that it's, you know, it's a pretty, it's, it is the largest department, the largest piece of the budget when you're, when you're talking about total funds. So as I mentioned, um, and I know that many of you are quite familiar with um, the experiences that the state had in 2017, but I think it is worth mentioning. Um, I, I feel like year over year, we sometimes lose what, what happened in previous legislative sessions, um, but because of revenue coming in lower than what was expected in 2016, the, the legislative uh, session in 2017 was a difficult one. Um, there were a number of cuts made during the regular session, and then the legislature went into special session later in that fall and made additional cuts. Um, DPHHS took a significant brunt of those cuts. And as mentioned, when, you, when we experience a cut in state general fund dollars, it also results in the loss of federal funds. So um, in total, that special session resulted in about uh, a cut of about $49 million to DPHHS and state funds. Um, and we estimate that it, it also resulted in the loss of, of probably about 100 million or so of, of um, federal dollars as well. Um, 
And some of these, you know, I, I, while the legislature did restore some funds back into 2018, um, in some instances, those restored dollars went into um, other, other important items. Um, so in many ways, um, services, you know, in many communities have not been restored. And I think um, we continue to sit at a place where many, many families are struggling to, to access um, services and, and particularly in, in rural areas um, where we saw really a, a big loss of mental health services, substance use disorder services, and, and many of that has not been, you know, built back up. So I'll talk just a little bit about what we could expect this upcoming legislative session. Um, this this is a this is a chart that shows what we uh, what what the legislature is projecting for revenue in the upcoming biennium. Um, so we've started with what I what we kind of consider as like the peak general fund revenue year of 2019. Um, we actually saw revenue come in. Uh, pretty, you know, pretty steadily in 2020. Um, we were actually prior to the prior to COVID um, seeing revenue levels coming in in excess of what the legislature had projected in 2019. Um, so that netted out, we definitely saw a loss of revenue in 2020, um, primarily, um, you know, specific um, uh, excise taxes. So um, taxes on accommodations, rental cars, those types of things, we saw a hit right away um, with COVID. And so 2020 revenue came in uh, about $40 million below what we saw in, in 2019. But, you know, fairly consistent with what the legislature had projected for that year. Um, you know, many, many states have felt the, the impact of, of COVID on state revenue levels much quicker than we have in Montana. Um, because we do not have a statewide sales tax, whereas other states are heavily reliant on sales tax, um, they saw that impact right away. Um, I'll talk a little bit, I have a slide where, you know, what our overall general fund revenue, what the makeup of that revenue is, but um, we rely more on, uh, for general fund purposes, on individual income taxes. Uh, so we do anticipate to see an impact on income taxes, but it really comes in the in fiscal year 2021 um, when people are are reporting their income in, from 2020 calendar year 2020. So you can see for 2021, we're expecting. Um, a pretty significant dip in revenue. Um, the legislature, this is, this is according to the, um, the revenue estimate that the, legis the legislative interim committee has set. And I would say that, you know, there are, it, there's just a lot of uncertainty about what we might expect in the coming year. Um, so, you know, I think that there, this could certainly vary. Um, it, it, it could certainly be, be lower than this as well. I think there's just a lot of uncertainty out there. Um, and then you see for 2022 and 2023, um, the legislature is projecting growth again in revenue levels. Um, we're still in 2022 below that, that high mark of 2019, um, but starting to kind of build back revenue in, those, in, the, in the next biennium. So a little bit about the budget process. Um, the executive branch starts the budget process with releasing their budget. Uh, Governor Bullock released his proposed budget on November 15th, that should say 2020. I have done this presentation like three times and I continue to fail to, to fix that. Um, but the uh, Governor Bullock did release his budget as required by law. Um, I'm not going to spend a, a lot of time on the details of what's in that budget, probably for obvious reasons. Um, but there are a couple things that I did want to note, and and there are others on this call that may have additional thoughts or comments as well. 
But generally speaking, Governor Bullock's proposed budget is essentially maintaining services um, into the next biennium um, at the current levels that have been authorized by the legis legislature. Um, we, call, we call this essentially a present law budget. So what would it take um, for, uh, the, uh, for the state to continue um, services at their current level? Um, and those adjustments are called present law adjustments. Um, so uh, overall, um, his budget includes a total, a uh, net total of 206 million in present law adjustments throughout the agencies. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about where we see those bigger present law adjustments. But that's really what it would take in order to maintain services. Um, the there are some new proposals included in the governor's budget i think probably the the main one for purposes of this call is uh an, an, a, a, 10 million dollars for early childhood education um that uh, you know I, he's he's proposed um funding for um for pre-k and early childhood education in previous budgets and he's he has proposed funding that at 10 million in this budget um, but generally speaking, there's not a lot of new proposals um, in the budget. It is really um, maintaining existing services. Um, the, I didn't include a lot of numbers or details on this, but I will say that, um, you know, his budget largely, it's, it's a balanced budget. Um, so even though we are experiencing uh, that revenue drop in 2021, um, we actually actually start this budget process with a very healthy ending fund balance or what Montana consider, considers its rainy day fund. Um, and so that really has mitigated any um, need for immediate budget reductions. Um, and, and what we find with, with his proposed budget is that we, you know, we can continue to fund existing services with revenue levels that we project coming into the state and continue to maintain a, a healthy ending fund balance by the end of the next biennium. So that's all good news. Um, and I think that we are in a, a better position than many other states that saw pretty significant declines in revenue right away. Um, and are having to tap their, their um, you know, rainy day funds quicker than, than we've had to. Um, the other note, so Governor Electri and Forte does have um, the ability to recommend changes to this budget. Um, though those recommend, re recommendations are due to the legislature and their fiscal staff by January 7th. Exactly what form that will take, you know, we don't know. Um, this has varied um, when there's a change in administration. So we could see really specific changes that he may propose or signals to the legislature, um, you know, to make reductions or changes to, uh, uh, you know, to meet a certain target amount. Um, we know that um, Governor Elect Gianforte has a subset of of legislators right now meeting um, to discuss the budget. And so I, I do anticipate that we may see something even before the end of the year. So a little more on what those present law adjustments are. So um, these are the main present law adjustments that we see um, within agency budgets. And again, this is really what it would take to just maintain current levels of service. Um, you see that there's some present law adjustments and corrections. This is just their present law adjustments. They actually have, do have some new proposals um, to add some staffing capacity um, to address increase in caseloads at Department of Corrections. Um, OPI, which is the Office of Public Instruction, they actually have the, the largest um, present law adjustment of, of, of these. Um, this is the K-12 inflationary adjustment that the legislature would make. Um, so it's, it's $92 million over the biennium. Um, and then DPHHS, I didn't include all of DPHHS.
caseloaded um, adjustments either up or down in the, what, what the department projects for the number of people um, who are needing services. Um, the big one being Disability Services Division is projecting a $33 million present law adjustment. Interestingly, Health Resource Division um, projects a negative caseload adjustment, um, both general fund dollars as well as federal funds. Um, I, you know, I think this is, this is interesting because that previous number where I've netted out present law adjustments of 205 million over all of the agencies, you can see, you know, that factors in a negative $41 million present law adjustment. And so, um, in many instances, you know, the positive present law adjustments are actually higher than that net number. So I, you know, I'll, I'll just, I'll just say, you know, I think there's, there is, all, there's a lot of talk um, right now and a lot of speculation as to what this budget process may look like. Um, part of the reason why I wanted to include this, this information um, there, you know, I think there's been statements made that um, the state should, you know, refrain from further growth in the budget or proposals of a, of a, you know, a net zero growth budget. And I think it's a big question about what that means. Um, I think if we're looking at a present law um, budget, you know, that's essentially what the governor, Governor Bullock has proposed. Um, but it's important to note that there is, there is growth inherent in just maintaining services. And so when we talk and, and we pose these questions to policymakers, I think that's going to be an important distinction. Um, and it will be important, I think, to really emphasize that, you know, we need at a minimum a present law adjustment. Um, and I think there are many areas where we've seen cuts in services um, and a, a need to, to invest more. Um, so, so I'll talk just a little bit of re about revenue. Um, I do want to note that my colleague Rose Bender will be with you um, for the breakout panels. Um, she's going to talk a little bit more in detail about what we could expect on the revenue side. Um, but this is essentially the same the same chart that I showed earlier. Um, and just as I had previously mentioned, you know, in order to continue to invest in a state budget, we need to also make sure that we protect existing revenue levels. Um, these two things go hand in hand. Um, in many instances, these conversations are really bifurcated up at the legislative session. So you have appropriations committee meeting and discussing different aspects of the budget, really going into detail about Sorry, Heather, you froze. Hopefully she'll come back in a minute here. Leaders who ask consideration, the constraints that, um, that, we're, that we're facing in communities and accessing services. So that is something that um, I think is important to note. So just, oh. Could you repeat what you said, what was important to note? Because I didn't hear any of that. <laughs> Thanks. Sorry about that. I might, my internet might be cutting out. I have husband and daughter all streaming at the same time. So apologies. Um, so I just, uh, what, what I wanted to emphasize is that, you know, what's, what happens um, often up at the legislature is that you have conversations around appropriations and then conversations around tax policy. Um, and I think what we try to do is connect these two things for legislators that, um, you know, what's, what's happening in appropriations and some of the struggles of many communities in accessing services um, really needs to be shared with tax committee legislators as they are considering tax policy changes um, that could ultimately um, reduce revenue levels in this, for the state of Montana. So 
So a little bit about where we get our revenue in the state. So this is just a slide that includes both um, both uh, state taxes as well as local taxes. Um, so I mentioned that we in Montana, our general fund is heavily reliant on individual income tax. You can see that that makes up almost half of our state revenue that comes in from taxes. Um, property tax is a smaller share of, of the pie on a state level, though, you know, it certainly is an important component of, of local taxes. So you can see on a local level, um, property tax is really the lion's share of, 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 of local taxes. Um, and that includes both local governments, counties, as well as K-12 school districts. Um, and then you can see, you know, we have some sales, some specific sales taxes in Montana, um, tobacco tax, the gas tax, um, accommodations, rental car tax, and then severance taxes. This includes natural resource taxes. Um, so in many ways, you know, we have a fairly diverse um, set of, of revenue sources in Montana. Um, but it, you know, it, on a on a local level, it's it's primarily property taxes that they are reliant on. And then my final slide, and again, like I said, Rose from our office will talk a little bit more about um, some of the tax stuff. But I think it's important to just get a sense of at least how we think about um, tax policy and and tax proposals. This is a slide of um, uh, the, the percentage of income, the share of income that goes to state and local taxes. And we've, we've um, split up the, the, the total um, number of tax payers in Montana by their income level. So you can see we've got um, the top, the wealthiest 1% of taxpayers in Montana, the next 4%, the next 15%, and then we break out um, the, the remaining 80% into basically, you know, uh, uh, quintiles. Um, and you can see that generally speaking, those at lower income are paying a higher share of their income in state and local taxes. Um, what I really like about this slide is the, um, the really the bars inside the bigger bar. Um, and we've broken out different types of taxes. So first, I, I think, you know, the, so income tax, which primarily goes to the state, you can see um, is progressive. And so those at a higher income level are paying a higher share of, of, their, of, of their income in that tax. We do have um, bra tax brackets. And so when you are in a, at a higher income level, you are paying a higher tax rate. Um, I will say that's changed over time. So we used to have a more progressive income tax. Um, our income tax has, has been flattened in many ways. Um, that legislation passed in 2003, but we do, you do see some, you know, progression uh, in our income tax still. And then property tax, you know, property tax has actually become fairly regressive. So um, this includes not just property taxes, but it also includes um, uh, vehicle registration. And so that this that is considered a uh, property. And so for this for this purpose, it is included in property tax. And you can see that um, those at a at a lower income level are paying a higher share of their income. You know that's uh, property tax to some extent. Um, you mitigate that a little bit because you you know generally if you are higher if you are higher income you may have a larger house so you have a higher property tax value um, but you know that only that to some extent like everyone needs a home right and so you're ultimately paying it either through you know through rent or through um, 
you know, through property taxes. And so it's certainly hitting lower income folks at a, at a higher rate. And then the sales and excise tax. So because we don't have a statewide sales tax, this is a smaller percentage across the board, but you can see sales taxes are very regressive. Um, in most states, this light blue line would be, you know, much, much higher across all of the income levels. Um, but again, lower income families are paying a higher share of the, the, the specific um, sales and excise taxes that we have in the state. So all of these things kind of net out, but you can see, generally speaking, um, you know, lower and middle income families are paying a higher share of their income. So this is something we look at as, as we look at various proposals as they come up to the legislature. What does that do, you know, to this to this chart? Um, is it, does it create a more progressive tax structure? Does it create a more regressive tax structure? Who's really being impacted? And who's getting the benefit potentially if, if, if it's a tax cut on the, on the table? So that, that is the conclusion of my slides, um, but I'm definitely happy to answer uh, any questions that folks have. Yeah, Heather, we have a couple questions coming in through the chat here, so I'll just read some of them off. Um, Katie Bark asks, can you discuss how the marijuana tax will impact the budget and if it will impact food, nutrition, or health programs? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so the, uh, I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, but the, the um, marijuana initiative does impose a tax on the sale of marijuana. Um, that ballot initiative established a series of state special revenue accounts where those funds would be allocated. It is ultimately the legislature that, um, that is authorized to make appropriations. And so, you know, we don't, I, I, I think we'll see what happens with the with the legislative session. Um, the I can't remember the total dollar amount, um, but the majority of the funds are are um, designated for conservation purposes. Um, so that ballot initiative included state special revenue account, and I think it's more than half of it goes into um, conservation purposes. Um, I do believe there is some um, funding for DPHHS, though I don't know that it's related to food nutrition. Um, I think that it's, uh, there is a, a portion of it that goes into, um, you know, substance use disorder treatment and, and other, um, other services through Medicaid. Um, about 10% of the funding would be allocated to the general fund. So there will there is some general additional general fund dollars, um, but again, the, you know the legislature will ultimately appropriate that funding during session. Great, thank you. Um, there's also a question here from Wendy Rogers around clarifying what income brackets you were referring to with, I assume, the graph that was up there. Um, and she states she does taxes and most lower income families get the earned income tax credits. So, um, and they pay very low state tax. So, and I assume that graph incorporates more than just income taxes, which is where that comes from. So yeah, that that's a great question. Um, so I don't I don't have what those what the lower um, brackets, but I I'll flag that for Rose that she could share that information um, in the in the breakout panels. Um, but it but you are right, Rachel, that the that chart does include um, local taxes. Um, it includes property taxes. So um, I think you could see that the income tax percentage was was quite low um, for that uh, for the lowest uh, uh, quintile and that is that is correct that um, the um, you know there is some refundable tax credits that are going to that area I will say that um, that chart does not factor in federal taxes 
So the, the federal earned income tax credit wouldn't be included in that, but we do have a, a relatively modest state income uh, EITC. And so that, um, that state EITC would be factored into that. Perfect, thanks Heather. We have another question here from Caroline Canarius and it says, given the appropriations committee assignments, do you have any insight into their approach this session and what we might expect from them? Yeah, that's, that would be great if you could elaborate a little bit on how this might impact the upcoming legislative session as we're gonna be discussing our policy priorities next. Yeah, definitely. Um, so I think that, uh, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot, quite a bit of uncertainty just about what session itself looks like. And so I don't know that I have a lot of detail about what we could expect from the committee. Um, we do have some newer members of the, of the subcommittee that will be focused on DPHHS's budget. Um, so Representative Matt Regeer will chair that subcommittee. Um, he has been on appropriations for the last couple sessions, but he uh, previously was uh, was in the subcommittee that uh, for the judicial branch Department of Corrections. So this is his first year uh, on the joint subcommittee for DPHHS. Um, and I, you know, I think many of the proposals that we've seen coming out of the Republican caucus, like I think I think he's been a driver of some of those. Um, you know, to look at possible reductions to the budget. Um, also, you know, a con this concept of a net zero budget. Um, so we'll see what that, you know, what that might look like. Um, the other, I think, worthwhile mention uh, on appropriations um, and the subcommittee for DPHHS is Frank Garner, Representative Frank Garner from the Kalispell area. He's been very, he's been great to work on. This is his first year on, on the Appropriations Committee. So I think that it, it, it would be really important for folks to, to reach out to Representative Garner, um, give him a sense of, of what these services have looked like. Um, but, you know, he's been, he's been great to work with and I think he's, he's a nice addition to, to that subcommittee. Um, certainly, uh, you know, many of you know um, Representative Mary Caffero, who has served on that subcommittee, both on, on the Senate side and now on the House side. I think we'll continue to be digging into both the appropriations piece and the policy side on, um, you know, what are, what are some of these important services. So I think another important person to, to be in touch with. Yeah, awesome. We have a couple more questions coming in here. Let's see. Um, and actually, I might interject my own question before I read these. So, Heather, we also have some nonprofit leaders on the call. Um, and so I was wondering if you could speak to a little bit about, um, you know, I think it's pretty obvious if you are part of a state agency why you might need to have a stake in the budget. But can you explain a little bit more on, on how this, this relates to nonprofits or where their voice might be helpful in the budgeting process? Yeah, I, I just, I would say that I think, um, you know, legislators are often, I mean, they, get, they have a lot being thrown at them in a very short period of time. And so connecting what all of this means um, on the ground in their communities, I think really does make a difference. Um, uh, we, I can talk about these numbers all day long with them, but I think it's, I have seen the value of, um, of individual um, service providers or leaders in the community really talking about what this looks like on the ground and it making a huge difference. Um, I, you know, we worked a lot on the creation of the, the state refundable earned income tax credit. And I would just say we could not have done that without um, the personal stories of what that means for families on the ground. So um, I, you know, I, I think that um, there's, there's often um, a, a reluctance or a feeling of nonprofits that they, that they can't weigh in. Um, certainly, you know, nonprofits are limited in their 501c3 status in engaging in electoral work, but um, it certainly 
the voices of nonprofit service providers and nonprofits are incredibly important during session um, and and very much allowed, right? Um, you know, consult um, the the various the various standards of of what needs to be reported, but um, nonprofits certainly um, have the ability to um, to talk with their policymakers about the you know the decisions that are in front of the legislature. Excellent, thank you. Um, we also have a question here from Reverend Valerie Webster. She says, thank you for explaining about Montana's rainy day fund, leaving us in a more po positive position than it might. Um, what else gives you hope during these pandemic and anticipated post pandemic challenging times? Thanks, Valerie. For <laughs> Valerie is always providing the optimism. In I our know, that's so great. That's <laughs> like what I need right now. Um, well, I will say that Montana, um, has been able to weather a, a lot of this um, because of federal dollars that have come in. And so while we um, had a strong rainy day fund, we, we've also been able to access the coronavirus relief funds, um, which lifted some pressure off of, of the state. Um, in some instances, uh, the state's been able to access a higher federal match for Medicaid, which has freed up some general fund dollars. Um, and so that I think has certainly been helpful. Um, I think we are all eager to see what happens on a federal level moving forward. Um, the, the legislature, the legislative finance committee met just yesterday and the governor Bullock's um, budget director emphasized the importance of um, you know, the, and, and the need for additional federal relief to states. And so um, I'm hopeful that we will see that early in, in 2021. Um, I think that, you know, that would help relieve a lot of, of, the, of the strains. Um, and I think the state, you know, generally speaking, did a, a really great job um, releasing those funds um, to support, you know, nonprofit organizations, um, businesses and, and individuals who have been disproportionately impacted by the pandemic. Um, so I think that that certainly was positive. Um, and I think it would be important for, you know, for Congress to take action um, to provide additional additional relief to states. Perfect. Thank you so much. And then I see Stephanie Staley submitted a question. She says, thank you for specifically mentioning Representative Garner. Are there other specific districts where constituent voices are particularly powerful in influencing the budget process? Um, boy, uh, I, I don't know if I can give like a, a comprehensive list right now. Um, I mean, I, I think that like there are, so what I, what I will say is that we, we have a number of new legislators, right? That I think we are all um, reaching out to and really getting a sense of what their priorities are. Um, we, we see a number of new legislators in the Great Falls area. Um, so I think, you know, that, that continues to be an, an important area for folks to, to reach out to, or if you have, you know, individuals with stories or um, leaders from the community that can share perspective. I think that's going to be a, an important area. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think that it, I think I would encourage folks to take a look at uh, who is on the subcommittees, the joint subcommittees for the appropriations and Senate financing claims. Um, you know, those are really going to be the key decision makers on the budget. Um, they will spend the first month and a half really drilling down in their particular piece of the budget. So if it's something within, um, you know, Department of Justice that you care about, like look at those legislators who were on the joint subcommittee for the Department of Justice and Judicial Branch. Um, if it's DPHHS, really thinking about who who's sitting on the on that subcommittee. Um, I think in many ways legislators look to those, those subcommittee members as as the experts in their piece of the budget. 
Um, so I think that's, I would say that's kind of the important place to start. And while it's good to have folks in local districts reach out to them, I also think that you all are experts, you know, in, in your, um, in the services that you provide. And so if Representative Garner is not necessarily your, your legislator, um, it is still okay to reach out um, and, and share your perspective. Um, so I would start, you know, with the, the joint subcommittees and I can throw, I actually just had it up. Do I still have it up? I will throw in the chat box, the link to um, the committee makeup as well, or the committees. Yeah, that's excellent, Heather. And you just answered the last question that was just submitted around the joint subcommittees. The, I've learned that the Montana legislative website has a shocking amount of information on it once you figure out how to navigate it. So um, yes, thank you, Heather, for putting that in there. And the leg.mt.gov has um, all the basics and you can even search bills and find out what's in the hopper right now leading up to the next session if you so choose. So. Um, I'll just check and see, does anyone have any other last minute questions for Heather before I move us on to the next thing? I'll give just a few seconds here in case anything pops up. Okay, it looks like we are good to go. So thank you so much, Heather. Um, we really appreciate that. And it's, I think, again, a lot of us being state employees or nonprofit leaders or people who are boots on the ground, it's not always easy to understand or see what's going on on a higher level and, and how it impacts us. So this is all super important and relevant information and we really appreciate you being here with us today. Yeah, happy to be here. Thank you. Perfect. Um, so I am going to be moving 